Good day, people. Okay, we need to update the meeting here. Let's see. Um, how's everybody? Is the let's see. I see a July third uh, meeting agenda. There is that. Um, we got to make a copy of that, right? Abe, Polly. Okay, um, nobody did the updated agenda here. Can I ask somebody, please, to um, start a copy of the team meeting agenda, and I can get going with the program here? Uh, but looks like the meeting has not been updated. Um, can I ask kindly that, for example, Abe, you think you can start the new working document for today? Working on a copy. Thank you, Abe. With that said, people, welcome to the Tuesday, July 10 meeting of the OSC developer team. We're all pretty busy here. Uh, let me share my, not share my screen. Um, good stuff. So the, the, the weekend, this weekend was very successful. So we, we the major update from the weekend is the successful build of the CNC circuit L. Uh, very very positive results because the circuit mills ended up working on a very first try and that was actually quite surprising because it's the first workshop we ran and uh, typically you have to do some troubleshooting and, and bug swatting when you do that kind of work this time fortunately we cut out a sample circuit we actually ran we, we milled a little uh, actually a stepper uh, breakout for the ramps board that can be used for larger stepper drivers the details but but point being we we milled successfully and that was a, a great event so we had a few people show up uh, to, to get the documentation on that um, probably the best place is to go to the OSC workshops Facebook page to look at some of the documentation which I'm pasting into the chat um, uh, if you want to look at that look at the I'll see workshops Facebook page and you'll see a plethora of pictures um, from the build I'll just gotta scroll down a little bit yeah so that's what the baby looks like um, we're there actually milling out a board now let me share my screen for everybody else to look at that uh, screen sharing And take a look at my screen uh, but yeah there's there's our man Andre one of the workshop participants who got one of the mills we kept one of the mills here for continuing prototyping and, and testing it uh, there's a lot of pictures let's see if you scroll down further yeah this is probably the main post um, yeah I'd like to go through that so that's the example of a little board we actually milled out. So what you see here with that, those blue terminals, that's a stepper breakout to connect a larger stepper driver to a ramps board to drive larger stepper motors. But um, that's that's the picture of the actual two mills that have been completed. Pretty much identical. Uh, that's, a, that's what a little tiny circuit board looks like, uh, where the process is you mill out the, the paths first then you drill the holes by changing a tool and then you actually cut the process. So we actually cut this tiny board out of a larger board uh, using uh, a milling bit at the end of the, the kind of a third, three step process. First you mill, then you, you do holes and then you mill out the contour from the board that you work on. So that's some of the software. This is flat cam for toolpath generation. This is where we cut out. So these are standard copper class circuit boards, and we mill out the little circuits out of them and come out at the end as the last step. This is more pictures. That's the thing in action. Uh, here, I believe it's this is the drill bit in there, 12,000 RPM, and poking out the holes in that circuit. And this little, two, you can see a little magnet there. This this tool holder uh, clamps down by these little screws and then there's a metal surface on the bottom of the mill 
where the circuit board holder is attached to it magnetically so you can move it around if you have a larger workpiece you can adjust it readily um, so that's kind of a detail of, of the picture and that is the, this is the first try this is the first thing we milled uh, the bed leveling worked perfectly the depth of the cut uh, just just a reference that depth that you see here is 0.1 millimeter one tenth of a millimeter so basically the bed leveling gets you to flatten the surface uh, you probe it with uh, the actual wor working tool you take like you know t four, four by four grid across the workpiece and you you get the level just like bed leveling and in, in the 3d printing and then um, this is the final step of where you cut out the board and you kind of snap it out because you, you leave little you leave little cuts in there so that the board doesn't fall out at the end of the milling job you have to break it out it's like a perforation and that's doing tool exchange you basically take a wrench to the tool head and and so forth you see those little springs there they prevent the head from falling down when the power goes out so that you retain the head up so the the, the drill bit or mill bit doesn't crash into the workpiece and break um, that's about it that's all we've got so very very fruitful event at this uh, this weekend right now we're actually installing the open source power meter um, if I go to my picture so Shane is still here from the workshop and right now he's installing uh, I want to show you some photos of that, but we also have the open source power meter. It's a, an example of a circuit that we mill with the the circuit that we just built. Uh, but let's see if some of the today's here you go. So this is where we were. This is um, so this is uh, one of the measuring nodes at the CD Eco Home electric panel. So what you have here is actually the three main wires coming from the PV panel array through DC breakers. And we're actually breaking into these breakers to measure current and voltage that's coming from uh, the entire PV system. So uh, we have nine nodes like that that we're installing. So each one of these measures one point. Like there will be three of these here to measure each of the banks, three banks of the PV panels, where each bank, bank has four solar panels on it. So there's 12 panels total. And these are 20 amp breakers. So we're basically feeding... 20 amps at 60 volts into the battery bank that we have um, so currently we're this is hot off the press I just took these pictures a few a few minutes ago and uh, that's what it looks like the what we have there is this is a uh, this is a shield for an Arduino it's got all this these data points for the nine different measuring nodes here that we're starting to connect uh, so this is basically a shield for an Arduino um, and it's an open source design the paper on that will be coming out pretty soon so there's more pictures of us working on and getting stuff to to work we had issues with the ground is grounded uh, the DC DC part of the system is not grounded the AC part of the system is ground to a ground rod so uh, we found that we had to connect ground the DC side of the system uh, to ground to make system because otherwise we're, we're not getting proper measurements but the the PV panel system here um let's see any better pictures these are all the different nodes the individual current voltage measuring nodes open source design we can mill this these with our circuits uh the most expensive component on this is the terminal block it's six dollars um there's a whole effect current sensor on it that costs about five dollars so the entire board is like fifteen dollars or so and materials um, that adds up but well, for example you can print the terminals using 3d printing and putting in like nut catchers and bolts. so an interesting case for 3d printing would actually be to doing power terminals for power electronics because because when you get to larger size terminals these are pretty large they they can handle I think 50 or 100 amps they're, they're quite sizable um, they cost six dollars a pop so so once you get get into larger devices, you, you might want to 3D print your connectors, which is a low-cost way to do it. Just put some nuts in there, some stainless steel bolts or something, and use them to clamp down and so forth. Um, that's how the system looks back there. That's, um, that's the panel. Inside there is our inverter and stuff. So 
Uh, we need nine Cat5 cables to connect all these. What we're using is this um, is through I2C actually. These are I2C connections. So, so in this picture here, um, the Cat5 cables are connected using IC squared. So it's basically serial connection, which means that you can in a series connect a bunch of these addressed modes. Each of these nodes addressed that the Arduino talks to one at a time all through like one wire. So that's very convenient. You have like a ton of wires. One wire you can connect to all these measurement nodes so that you're addressing one of them at a time because they're addressed through the I2C protocol. Oh, what you see there here? How about that? That's a little three printed DIN rail. So these are DIN mounted uh, DC breakers. That's a three printed DIN rail that the the DC breakers hang on to. And we're actually thinking of uh, down our power meters right now. They're hanging in midair. They get scrolls, but we could print more of these DIN rails and put a little uh, the the power meter nodes on the DIN rails that are 3D printed. So you can be thinking about different applications of 3D printing in this entire exercise. Um, that's about all I have for, for the report. The, today I'm actually interviewing three people for the immersion program. Uh, if you talk about, if you go to the wiki on the immersion program, there's a number of people applying. Uh, looks like we have two people that are definitely um, going to the immersion program. Um, still uh, just getting the, some of the last publicity. I published, publicized a lot through colleges and universities, like 25 different colleges. Didn't get a single bite out of that. All the people that came through so far were people who already knew about OSC primarily, except for two people. Uh, most of the people that are applying right now, which we have about, um, I think about eight people that are applying right now, there's, um, most of them have heard about OSC, so it's basically our are true believers that are signing up for this. Uh, so there's both the Merton program and the one with boot camp. Uh, the boot camp is the on sort of micro factory boot camp where we focus on on the small tools of the desktop micro factory. And come on, I will talk to him after this meeting where we're talking about his potential as well. Interestingly there's two um two developers, two former developers that are uh, applying for the program. So that's interesting how we kinda have this onboarding path from developer to maybe getting into deeper involvement with OSC. Okay, um, that's about all for me. Let's see. Do we have um, A, did you do it? It looks like you did it. Let me click on that. Okay, excellent. Um, we got the July 10th agenda, so that's, that's pretty much my report. Um, Yeah, uh, Abe, would you mind um, actually changing the current meeting wiki page as well, if you would mind? Then we can check in with um, other people on, on progress. So, yeah, I mean, to get a different machine and, you know, like the, the whole promise of the D3D construction set where you can have different tool heads, I must say it was really rewarding to see that, like... Um, yeah, yeah, very good feeling to see that, um, kind of get a feeling for a different machine and, and really to get to see the mechanics of how a, a, a drill, a CNC milling machine works. That was really nice to see with, with its entire kind of whole tool chain from, from actually, we, we, we started in KiCad. So what you see, the, the little circuit that we milled out, um, that circuit we actually designed in KiCad right on the spot there. We took, um, you know, headers. And just basically a few connections, draw a few connections, which which were mapped out within KiCad. So it's a great exercise of, of going through that whole tool chain from KiCad into exporting that using FlatCam, and then using Shane's open source Copper Carb software, which does the control. So it does like the zeroing, the, the bed leveling, then the running and switching out the tool uh, the tool tool bits uh, that are handled through Cop Carb. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite excited about that to see that kind of the, the pieces coming together all together uh, in this small desktop micro factory. Okay, so we pass it on to um, more people. Um, Eric, do you want to uh, provide some feedback on where you're at right now? Uh, 
Oh, Erica, I'm not sure if you're trying to speak, but we're not hearing anything. Eric, if you're having trouble, just refresh. Um, looks like you are trying to speak, so maybe you're not muted. Maybe, maybe try to refresh. Yeah, we can. You can. I cannot. Huh? Why can I not hear you? Uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe let me stop my screen sharing. See if that helps anything. Um. You guys can? Huh. I'm going to hit refresh right here, guys. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, let's see. Is this any better? Is, um... Eric, can you hear? Oh, I still can't. Wow. Uh, what is going on here? How about maybe get my setup? Oh! How about turn up the sound? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, Eric, sorry about that. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I uh, didn't make a lot of progress in the last week. I had a lab meeting yesterday. But um, I was uh, moving around with the... Uh, uh, PCB punch in free cab and um, I, I added um, the beginning of um, the next steps on the key, uh, on the key cab free cab page. Um, so working on um, adding the individual parts. So um, I located that library and um, I'm, uh, I have the details on how you. Uh, where you put those files, um, but I when I try to assign those models, um, they're, st they're still not showing up on the 3D uh, view, so um, I'm not quite sure um, if I'm what I'm not doing correctly. But um, and then some other issues. So um, the, the library is nice. It's um, got representations of major parts, but it doesn't, of course, have every single individual part. Uh -huh. um, so I'm not sure if um, it's really not important that we have every single um, little part for the three years. Uh, so um, I think I'll just try to take the basically just the PC board with all the parts and um, the um, D3D uh, Assembled models. Um, so the, the clearance of them no, won't be quite weak, but um, we'll at least have that represented. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And also uh, within KiCad, it turns out KiCad has very nice three dimensional uh, renderings of the, the things you can make within KiCad. So that's another route to go. You can, I think, you can export in step file, I believe, uh, out of KiCad as well. So uh, that toolchain can be combined and, and uh, really perfected at one point. But uh, the 3D views from within KiCad, where you get like a whole uh, rendering of a circuit board, that is really nice. That is very professional looking. Um, so we can also try including that um, in the future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's continue. Um, anything else, Eric, or is that about it for now? Um, that's the what I've been working on. Um, I mean, if anyone wants to take a look and um, see if uh, they can uh, work with this workbench, or if they have any suggestions on, on how to uh, add the parts or not. Uh, that would be good, but I'll keep pushing on that and um, then focus on the uh, micro factory machines and doing that design. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the Inger, is that your photo or that someone else's post? 
Uh, so that's mine. Okay. Um, I think. Uh, oh, I see you. Really was down. Um, so that's uh, just when I was doing that. But I can uh, upload those dimensions directly to the Wikipedia future. Okay. Um. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Cool. Uh, are you talking about the edge, um, the uh, presentation, or the edge on the WD page? No, uh, I'm talking about from your log. I hit the link you had from. Uh, yeah, I can do stuff. Yep, that's good. Or we know many. Okay, yeah. So continue. Um, you definitely have a good, a good um. Support like uh, on a D3D. Uh, if you boot up the D3D since you circle mill page, the burn down ad is getting pretty complete. So if you had, um, let me see, uh, let me share my screen again here. But on a D3D CNC circle mill page, uh, if you look at uh, there's development template item number 12. And the burn down should be right underneath it. And that is looking like documented, it's like 50%. In other words, we got a lot of the different, you know, a lot of our um, development templates look pretty empty. But here, these are getting pretty much filled. I think we can, um, sometimes, of course, the, the te development templates lag behind what's actually been done. So people haven't filled, like myself, I maybe haven't filled stuff in. Um, but yeah, we've got quite a bit of assets and CAD and everything and the actual pretty decent build pictures and video. If you go to that, if you click on that, for example, there's a, I took a lot of pictures throughout the thing. I basically upload everything to my YouTube, it's the YouTube, Facebook, and then I just embedded that in a way so you can see the whole build procedure pretty much as it went. Um, with with a lot of important details like for example one thing we found was that we needed to put tape around the uh, carriages the bearings because bearings were very very slightly loose um, and for the cnc circuit mill we want the very high precision so that tightened up bearings in there and we also put for example tape on the very end of the rods so that the uh, uh, no, the printed parts would slip on rods and we get force on the on the axes um, beyond that, you have the detail of the springs so that the machine doesn't collapse upon power off to gravity. There's the mounting of the spindle. We put six rubber bands in there so spindle does not go down. Uh, that holds it perfectly. Here's our electrical panel, which is the same style as on a, on a 3D printer. Uh, basically a plexiglass piece that's zip tied on and it looks pretty neat and so forth. Uh, there's more details of the rubber bands. Uh, here's drilling of the panel. Now controlling, the, this is copper carve. That's the control software. Uh, more mounting. Uh, dial indicator, we tested the backlash. We corrected the backlash. And we found about two, two thousandths, which are 50 micron. We found about 50 micron backlash, which we corrected out in the software. The software, you type in the the backlash value to correct in that way we were able to get down to about 10 micron resolution which is very nice here's the pcb holder with the magnets being made here's how they look before the milling machine completed uh some good tutorials throughout like for example explanation of the entire entire tool chain or the electronics uh there's a lot of that so so yeah very well well documented at this point and continuing to build upon it. I guess, Eric, what, you can really nail the... Okay, I guess there are three CAD. We have a TAN. That shouldn't really be a TAN because we have a TAN for the non-detailed version. We're going to take it to 20. <laughs> now we'll take it to a real TAN because right now we don't have a lot of the details that you're going to put in. Um, but for as far as a working working CAD model, it is there. It's, it's pretty much good. Okay. Uh, continuing, so that solves the circuit L for now. Um, 
Abe, do you have more to cover on the power cubes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes, we can. Alright, I'll do that. Um, with a um, few changes, I got the engine, I think, pretty well static. Um, mm -hmm. You can see there, and I, I've been putting that back in the frame and starting to edit that. Yeah. Because uh, there's some changes there. It's going to have to be quite a bit bigger. As you probably see from the images, it needs to be taller and longer, obviously, to fit the whole length of the engine plus the, the pump module and all that in there. Um, it needs to be a couple inches longer in depth and probably an inch taller. Uh, well, yeah, at least to accommodate this this breather cap that I added to the top of the engine because that's that's like 18, I think, at the recorder total height on that. Although I've got... Uh, I mean, there's probably I'm going to change the symmetry of this side plate, so I think there's a notch at the bottom, and that should help that as well, and it'll make it more symmetrical anyway. Uh, that way there's no difference either direction, you flip it, which is nicer to uh, And hopefully that'll make it easy to slide the engine in and out if I get it tall enough. Uh, I mean, technically, once you get it in there, as long as that, that the top of it isn't sticking out of the, the top of the frame too much where it could get bumped. Although this, the big tech frame, uh, it goes on top of the other stuff, but if something got up there and hit the top, you wouldn't want it to break anything. So ideally, it doesn't quite stick out top. Hopefully, if I get it even or something. Um, so the symmetry on all that could be even with the size and everything. Uh, it's not too hard to update the way we got it edited. Thankfully, uh, the frame is imported with this simply do so. It's able to not have to make a lot of changes uh, to the constraints again. I'm not sure it's going to have to constrain that, but it works a little better when you import the um, whatever the base component is in the file through the assembly too, but, and then merge the other parts on that, which is Basically, back to Roberto's tutorial. Uh, one, one change I was looking at. Uh, I was adding some other parts, the sleeves and stuff, to match. Um, uh, hopefully, I found I found a little more detail on the uh, a little more detail on the engine, the bolt mounts, and those kinds of things, patterns of what what matters. Since we're going to be cutting, uh, hopefully, with the torch table, all that, get it accurate enough just to, to pull it together without any modification, hopefully, but. The uh, that's one of the sleeve components. It, it, it's on. It's created. Um, the it's the sleeve couplers. What are they going to photo up there? It's kind of designed. It's not simple. It's not to edit, but I know that it was made as like a single unit involved and stuff. I was thinking that a good rule, especially because I think we're going to want to be using the. Uh, it's probably free crack point one seven, as I understand. It has nesting abilities uh, for doing uh, cutting, for making, you know, tilts for exporting, for cutting in the torsicle. So uh, the part there I notice is is probably needs to be edited differently because it, you know it's a perfectly good way to draw when everything's kind of a monolithic part. And it's simple. It was hard to edit the bubble pattern. I changed a little bit. But it's all one part instead of being it's faster to create it that way when it was made that way. But I think a good rule uh, could be added to like the free cat free cat page somewhere would be that components should be made out of their the sub the actual sub parts, which takes probably more to draw. But if we draw them that way, that ensures that we can always get the two dimensional patterns because otherwise. Like with that sleeve, if you try to select, uh, say, the, the two-dimensional pattern for the in plate, it's not quite right because it's not made out of a pipe subcomponent and then the in plates. They're not separate. So the dimensions wouldn't come out right that to extract the, uh, the 2D pattern from. So uh, it's question kind of like it would be ideal. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Abe, uh, do you have an updated file uploaded somewhere? Where, where could I find that? Can you put a link? Uh, they're all listed, I believe all, all the files that I, I, I listed, I put on my log, that I updated, they're all on the, 
I was on GitHub, but I, I'm pretty sure I linked all of the files that I updated on the log. Okay. Uh, so, let's see, the... Uh, it, it looks like the, 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 the link at the bottom uh, for today is to the... Yeah, that would be to Power to version 11. It's the bottom link on today's okay. log. Got it. Got it, Peyton. That would be the file that, yeah, I, the main, uh, the Cuban engine module. Um, I like the transparency in there. Like that. That's, that makes it look good. Yeah, I updated. Yeah, I guess so I, could, I just did it so I could see the, um, the how it's fitting through the, uh, or not fitting. Visualize how it doesn't fit uh, through the, the tank wall there. But uh, I did update the, uh, the bottom plate already. So that it just fit to it on it correctly. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks centered okay. Mm -hmm. Similar to how it was. Um, yeah, the engine fits as far as width. Yeah, that's good. I thought it was worried that it wouldn't that way, but it obviously it needs to be longer, the deck front to back, uh, to get that so the pump fits mm -hmm. in there. Which, so, but it wouldn't have to be increased that much. But that engine is quite a bit longer. Uh, by the measurements than what the previous rough model was, so that's, that's how that's going to have to be. Um, right. Right now we're going to slip it out the side through that notch. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. And I need to I need to make a notch up top, and it's going to have to be a little bit taller, maybe. Uh, it looks like just to make it. Mm -hmm. Well, with, with the rubber feet, which. Actually, let's see. Let's see the thing. I've got certain distance. I think we talked before about how that the, the engine shaped around a lot, so there needs to be a pretty big gap maybe between the cooler at the front and the engine. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if that has to do with the rubber feet. I've got them being an inch tall in there, and I figured that's kind of what it sounded like they were. And I wonder if it's shaking around too much. I can't really talk that. But that before, but you see, there's quite a bit of vibration there, and I wonder if the feet are are they too almost loose, and they're actually enabling to vibrate more instead of damping it. I mean, there's like a line between you know a certain kind of cushion, uh, you know, stopping the vibration, and maybe if it's too soft, it lets it shake on too much. So yeah, well, we can I don't pump those down harder. That would be. I don't think you have yeah. too much rubber. Is the rubber you can really clamp down hard, and then you get it to vibrate uh, as you need. I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, they they're making it a little bit taller, obviously, because like the feet underneath it there. But um, you could probably slide the engine in, and then get them get it up on the feet after uh, it slides in there. It would be too tall, sticking out the top at all, but. Um, yeah, hopefully, I mean, there's probably other things that you could do with the, for as far as the rubber pieces, um, if it needs to be harder rubber scraps or something, but I guess it depends on what resources you've got, uh, mm -hmm. they're easiest, um, recycled. recycled rubber scraps or something, but, um, yeah, that, that's closer to, there's still a bunch of plumbing stuff to do here yet, but the frame, uh, yeah, it just needs to be longer, which shouldn't take too long to update. Um, mm -hmm. the, I think the edits, I think the way I've got it, it's pretty easy to edit and update the, the frame and the whole, whole thing. It worked good earlier, which is updating the uh, bottom plate, so the size and adding some more symmetry, and then back to the back to the plumbing. Uh, but yeah, let's see. Yeah, the rule. Um, here to describe that, the, the, the parts, I think it would be good that as a rule. That way, we always make parts in a manner that's designed so that, not just so that they can be edited easily later, but maybe so that we can select the, the actual parts or subcomponents of, of a part. And I don't think we would divide it into like whole files. I think we'd just have people editing to make sense of that, but mm -hmm. at least. The, the, the individual plates or whatever might be being cut and then assembled together and welded, that kind of thing, it needs to be separate components. That yeah. way it can be selected for, for cutting on the table. So right. I guess that should be added as a rule tomorrow on the wiki. I don't have to. Well, 
Does our, and I just thought I'd ask. Well, yeah, I, don't we cover that in our pry rules, which say that you have a part library, and then from the part library you um, draw your parts? Well, what, I mean, the part library has, you know, the major parts in it. Um, uh -huh. Maybe I should share my screen to explain oh, this better. So, yeah, go ahead. Some parts, um, the, the, the individual parts like that sleeve coupler, right. it's a part on its own. We don't want to really subdivide that into more files. I don't think that would just make a, a mess. Right, um, right. It, it's apply logic to what you know what should be in a separate file and what shouldn't be. And it's simple enough it shouldn't be. But it's partly the way that uh, we draw stuff, I think. It's, so it's not drawn as a monolithic part. And I don't think a lot of parts are done that way. It depends. It's quicker and easier just to draw it in the simplest method you can, and so I think sometimes that's done to say time. But, um, and this this is an older part that was drawn, but um, it was drawn as, as a revolution, so it was rotated, and now it's a, uh, a single part that's not assembled of smaller subparts. Instead of being assembled out of plain material for each end and a piece of pipe in the middle, it's just one part. So I just think that it would be better to set uh, just to describe that something more in the wiki so people know that it's good to divide down. It takes more time because you got to draw each part separately and then assemble the smaller subparts together. But then it's, a, it's more realistic and apparent that those parts are like separate parts that are being welded together, which I think is yeah. the, you know, generally the correct way to yeah. do it in CAD. Yeah, that's um, good. I like that. If the CAD could that, reflect the fabrication procedure, I think that's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah, that would be ideal. So uh, I'll, I'll look at the, the week and see what's described in a few kept pages and see if yeah. that can be updated. Yeah, yeah, if you could do that. Cool. Um, yeah. And and then, let's see. I think I was talking about different uh, possible other other suggestions for the way the CAD is done, but I, I, I learned to set too many rules on the CAD just because I think it's better to let people kind of figure out the best way to, or different ways to do something uh, on their own. So I, I just generalize on the CAD because somebody might figure out a better way to do something in free CAD than, than we know already. But we've got the tutorials that, you know, we're done already and, and those are pretty good. Um, they describe right. pretty well how to, how to put modules and parts together so yeah no i mean definitely share the you can definitely you know document the practices they could be suggestions or best practices um yeah i i have a, some suggestions to put it to maybe tutorial eventually i'm kind of experimenting with those more to see what sometimes there's there's you know exceptions in different ways so it's going to make just firm rules about stuff so um eventually eventually i think i'll have some, some more suggestions to put to tutorial uh, get a better idea how some of that works. The separate you know, sketches and things to edit easier, but, but it's, I've got a pretty, pretty smooth idea of working for CAD with the method that uh, we've laid out so far. Um, and, and freaking legacy still, but um, I think the only thing that will. The only thing I know that we need for CAD point one seven four from what I read before, it sounds like, is for um, that nesting because I believe that works and that's on the on a list of stuff to is figuring out how to nest the parts and get all that stuff on so for for cutting. Sorry, nesting with a new 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 version. Yeah, I was going to talk about that probably months back, but uh, I was looking at those different methods for nesting, and that that one process using, I think, a, a web tool and other things yep. was not very, um, it, it, it didn't work out, plus it it was a long tool chain. Anytime you have those tool chains with a bunch of different software, it's like, you know, something changes and it, it's going to break anyway, even if it works immediately. And FreeCAD, every, everything is so important and central for the stuff to work in FreeCAD, a lot of other people are relying on the nesting there. I don't know what kind of bugs it might have. Which workbench um, is that in? So it that. The nesting feature is in FreeCAD 0.17, unless I knew. Um, okay. I don't know if it's just in the in the final version or if it's in dailies, more or less, because I 
I think I was using it in the, the only CAD I tried to use it a little bit was in a daily of free CAD 0.17 before they finalized that. Uh, so I'm not sure what the final version is like, but it was suggested, it's just on the free CAD form that, that that does have some functionality. It should uh, work well enough to enable to do most parts. And I assume that there's improvements ongoing work in that. Um, I haven't got to test that real thoroughly in a while. Yeah. Okay. That's. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think that pretty well covers the power key pad. Okay. Um, uh, what are your next steps? Um, well, let's see. I'm going to adjust this, this frame quick. Get that to fit thoroughly. Increase the size. Should be hard. And it looks like, uh, looks like there's some like, uh, there's glitches with the constraints of the plumbing. Wait. It looks different on my screen than your screen. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. Hmm. Might have some it looks like there's a stray... Oh, I know what's wrong there. That's... that's... okay, so... Yeah, I know what's going on. Whenever you download these files, there's a bunch of files this way. The way Roberto and Stephen did it with the tutorial... Um, in the tutorial, he suggests... Of course, everything be merged except for that when we use the assembly to workbench to get the um, parts to constrain correctly you need to uh, import a base part with the um, with the assembly to workbench import function and so there's a number of files that are some of the old files you go back in there and it'll it'll give you errors when you open them it'll say you know a path with a path Berto's path or to my path I see a lot Whoever edited the files has a has a. Uh, unfortunately, I tried um, I tried using the uh, the home uh, what is it the universal home path and it won't do that on Linux. Apparently, FreeCAD won't accept that, so it's always like a static path to whoever imported the files because the assembly to workbench when you import those files that way it refers to who, the file and the folder path that, that whoever imported that. And so there's always one file or one one part of the file that's imported that way for the assembly to workbench and so you have to update it on your on your drive every time you use it. Which is kind of an annoyance or a glitch with the assembly to workbench unfortunately, but that's what happens there? So currently, you're you're missing the um, Roberto created the the filter part, and that's why it's it's missing there. The red uh, is kind of floating out front because between those two pipes is supposed to be the filter, but it was imported by Roberto originally. So whenever you go look at that part in the list, you'll, you'll see that the path is not up to date. No, there it is. I I just oh, okay, it did. It found the file. Oh, wait, it, huh. it did something else, though. Well, that's strange. Yeah. Okay, I don't I don't know how it updated it, but it, yeah. Hmm. Oh, oh, okay, maybe you unhit all those other parts. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a minor issue with uh, the assembly to workbench, but it, oh, if yeah. you have the files on your drive, it'll usually find an, an import, it suggests to import a the different file if it's at a similar path, I think. But um, I suppose that's the GitHub uh, or better because it, it lets you download the whole um, package with all the paths and everything, and that that it may work better um, for editing that kind of stuff easier. But with having to read, got to move all the files and get all the necessary files in the right place, but. Okay. All right, that, that's that is. Um, yeah, a lot of plumbing to do. But, uh, oh, that, the other thing besides the uh, free cat stuff, um, I did finally find Zentaf for a while last week. And I was trying to find stuff on some contact points and things on the university. I didn't find anything, but recently I was, I was searching again and I found a local makerspace in Central Arkansas that I didn't uh, notice before. Uh, I think it just opened like the last year or so. I'll have to see if I can contact um, if there's any interest there. 
I look up, there's a lot of information on it. I'll, I'll add links to that somewhere. Um, it's the University of Central Arts on Conway. They and apparently another organization, which I get is a local nonprofit that does entrepreneurial uh, sorts of uh, uh, promotion and, and with businesses and stuff in, in the area. Uh, it's called the Conductor. Apparently, they they created a, a maker space. It's basically part of the university area. Um, wow. And I don't know how popular that is, but there, there could be a bunch of people in the area. I noticed that the information online shows they have a variety of, um, you know, 3D printers, things like that. But I don't think any of it is open source. So I don't know if there's, you know, any, you know, openness to open source stuff or, you know, it might be because I figure some of those proprietary solutions are easier. But it doesn't look like they have a lot of, you know, advanced equipment. So I imagine there must be some people that, that are interested in, uh, you know, some open source uh, Hardware 3D printing related things like that. Mm -hmm. um, didn't look like they had any plastics recycling or film equipment. I don't know how big of an area uh, space it is. Um, didn't look like it's likely in a very email them, see, see if you can establish contact and see if they're. Um, yeah, they might have uh, emails. I was looking for that. I didn't see email. Okay, but there's some kind of. Uh, Forms or something, I think, in relation mm -hmm. to the conductor. Right. So you might be more interested in the, um, the, the, there's somebody that runs a non-profit organization that has helped create or fund that maker space in relation with the university. Uh, it's supported apparently by a bunch of local businesses. Apparently they bring through, uh, it's open to the public. Some, you have to go to like training classes at different times or sign up for those to learn how to use the equipment kind of thing. I think that's mostly what they do. They bring through both um, uh, like younger school children and I guess college students can do their well from the university. Um, they do different classes at different times that way. I guess the public signs up for maybe the same classes. But there's somebody I think they tell you to run the makerspace as well as. Um, Potential contact information for the nonprofit organization that, that funds it and does a bunch of entrepreneurial uh, related promotion in the region. So I'll have to copy some links to that, uh, get some of those. So. Yeah, reach out to the, reach out to them and see if they're uh, just pass on our info to them. Just let them know we exist because we're pretty yeah. close, relatively close. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, let's keep moving on. Sounds good. Um, you can, are you considering joining that space or how far is it from you? Uh, no, it's, it's a long ways away from me. It's in central Arkansas, but I don't get down there very often. But okay, so I have to drop in there and uh, get to town and see what's actually there. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know if it would be worth going through and joining. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah, see... Uh, Stash contact to you if there's any calm ground. All right, let's um, move on to, uh, let's see, um, Ruslan, do you have uh, any, anything you'd like to share? Well, I'm going to be very, very short. Okay. Uh, on Sunday, I attend the assembly, and this is a meeting of our question of H group. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we made of no knows for photos and uh, yours it will take uh, some time for post processing and uh, when it will be finished like uh, which uh, some complete data i will report more detail this is for the their their charge controller or what uh yes solar, solar box okay yes okay Mm -hmm. Are you moving any any forward on on the three D printer? Oh, no, no. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, that sounds good. So let's see. Anyone else? So I have. Um, I'm talking to Hagman later on here. Uh, anyone else? That any other notes or questions? Let's see. Eric. Yeah. Yeah. 
If nothing else, then let's see what you got on our questions page. But those are primarily from last week. Um, yeah, so I'd like to wrap up then. And um, yeah, the, the present state here is uh, preparing for the, the immersion program and the boot camp. Uh, definitely, um, so I started looking again at, at the filmmaker, the, the Fabat from the Michigan Tech University. That's looking really good. The papers, papers very nice. It's uh, it kind of gives the whole perspective of recycling and the economics involved. The attractive thing is if you have a, and they actually lay it out, lay out the economics there. But that's a core part of the micro factory. But uh, if you have your scrap plastic, it costs only 2.5 cents per kil per kilogram of filament that you make. Now that is very sweet, isn't it? It's basically the cost of electricity it takes to run the the filament maker which takes about uh, 250 watt hours per kilogram, according to the paper. Uh, sorry, 2.5 kilowatts per kilogram of filament produced, which is very attractive. That translates to about 25 cents in electricity costs per kilogram. And their production rate is, is about a kilogram every two hours. So every um, every day, if you have this thing running 24/7, you can make 12 rolls of filament. So that's worth, you know, 200, 300 dollars per day of pr productivity, if you're actually cranking out filament, and that's that's great. Uh, their version also has the filament width sensor. It's got a lot of feedback, so I think that's the thing we want to go with. I asked um, Lyman, Hugh Lyman, to actually make make us an extruder basically he's, he's going to do that for us help us produce that so we'll have both uh, likely to have both the Lyman version and the the recycle bot from from Michigan Tech for the immersion program and I think that's yeah just of the filament making and 3d printing that's a very powerful part right there because the 3d printing film could be a product that people are selling or um, just simply recycling low plastics of all kinds of different qualities um, other than that, um, continuing to, I'm going to just finish up advertising a little bit uh, on the immersion program. I've got interviews and vetting people that we're going through right now. Uh, some people are basically presenting presentations for their local communities, uh, get support for the, the immersion program. So that there's pool from the community that uh, community development organizations, different uh, things like Chamber of Commerce, that can endorse the people in their local communities so or reach out to with the different candidates that are applying and I'm once again inter interviewing three people today so I'll do that later so yeah uh, well that about wraps up for for today uh, we'll continue next week uh, at home here I'm working on the D3D version 16 point I guess it's 16 point um, oh seven which is the latest version, the one that's shown on site number five. That's the one that's currently being um, produced here, but just refining some of the details, optimizing the extruder, just getting the extruder into the CAD because we actually don't have the extruder fully in the CAD. Um, so f finishing that up. So yeah, well, um, uh, wrapping up. Uh, so the slide, the, the sixth slide, the development narrative slide, still, still stands pretty much as, as true large part of that so just let me discuss that just for a second here large part of it is is the roadmap to the to the immersion program um, but besides that there's also the one element that kind of bothers me a little bit is the uh, herox micro factory but when we get to that we're kind of you know getting way delay on that in terms of actually getting it done but we do want to do the crowd funded crowd design challenge of the of the cordless drill i think still that's a very very worthwhile experiment we will actually do that in the uh within the first week called boot camp of the immersion program uh open source micro factory boot camp we will have a session we're going to dedicate a few hours to that where we actually produce the parts and, and produce a battery pack the truck and all that and, and basically make a cordless drill which is be straightforward because you buy the buy the parts like the the small motor and the chart and other things you print up the body print up the battery holder do a little bit of electronics perhaps with a cnc circuit mill and there you go we have a cordless drill so we're aiming for a high quality version that that can be very usable because we, we do go through a lot of drifts here uh, beyond that 
same old same old immersion program development i haven't been doing work on book i get it back to that and basically with immersion program that's kind of taking my time uh, but i do want to get back to the book to lay out the, the theory and, and allow align the whole OC community to to go forward on this so with that said i think we can wrap up here and look forward to next week uh, so we'll see you all next week um, on tuesday same time 2 p.m and report then okay thanks a lot everybody and for Herman, we're talking right now, so you can hang on there. Thanks a lot, everybody.